Mm. There we go. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Happy Sunday. It is April the 3rd. It's 11 a.m. here in the Denver region, and uh, we're streaming at our new time on Sundays. So I uh, wanted to do this to accommodate people from uh, different countries who couldn't make it to the evening live stream. So I'm going to do this for a little bit, and uh, hopefully the audio is coming through. So I will need folks to drop in chat, like, does the audio sound okay? Uh, balancing the music and my microphone, because I've had a lot of microphone issues. Um, so hopefully it's coming through okay. Hey, Zoe, good to see you. Uh, Python Nate, uh, Karan M645. Yeah, I appreciate the follow. Thanks for that. Give you some uh, blinky lights and smoke pops. Thank you. Yay. Welcome. Um, and uh, current Mod 4 student at Turing. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun doing the uh, the Postman talk for all of you the other day. Um, you might have seen in chat, I sent a message from my Ian the Postmanot account. That is my work account. Um, so I'm actually watching that on another browser just to make sure that all that's coming through okay. So I'm actually watching that on another browser. And the audio sounds pretty good, actually, to be honest. So I turned off all the filters, all the settings on the microphone, and the only thing I turned on was noise suppression. And so hopefully, hopefully it'll go okay. We'll see. Um, but yeah, I got my camera fixed. Got the microphone, I think, back in a better place. Got music going in the background now. So hopefully, fingers crossed, hopefully we'll, we'll be kind of back to normal. So yeah, welcome to the Tech Interview Guide. So uh, by way of introduction, I'm Ian, Ian Douglas. I'm the author of the website here, techinterview.guide. And uh, I've got a ton of free material, free resources on there. Um, if you want to learn about my perspectives on the tech interview scene and kind of what goes into tech interviews, uh, why they're important, why we have to demonstrate what we do. Um, I've got a free email series that you can sign up for <clears throat> so you can find all that information. Uh, you will see some scrolling text like down in the bottom corner over here in the interface uh, with all kinds of helpful stuff. You can do like bang commands uh, to see a list of like helpful things that you can do. Um, you can redeem chat points for things like remind me to hydrate and tell a dad joke and all that kind of stuff. Um, but down in, in that area there, you'll also see some instructions on how to get to uh, the email series and what the email series is all about. Um, so the email series, just by way of, of quick intro on that, is it's six weeks long. I, I wrote it while I was teaching at Turing. These classes are crooked. Um, I wrote it while I was teaching at Turing and basically wrote it to be an entire Turing module of six weeks. Um, and so if you subscribe right before day one, then you get the last message at the end of the, the module. Um, and so it was kind of on purpose. I've since been going through and rewriting it. I've really procrastinated on that. I've been, you know, I had the, I was going to do it by the end of the year and then I ended up changing my job and then the job hunt spilled into 2022 and then getting ramped up on a new job has been busy. So one of these days I will get to it, I promise. I'm gonna switch over to this window since it's just me. Um, I had my, my Stream Deck thing programmed to go to that other scene. So, sorry about that. Um, let's see, what else is going on? Um, oh yeah, so with the email series, when it's over, it's six weeks long. As soon as it's over, it unsubscribes you. So you don't have to go in and unsubscribe. You can unsubscribe at any time and it'll, it'll stop sending you messages. Um, but once you reach the end, it just dumps you out of the database. Um, and I do that on purpose because I don't like spamming people. I don't like, uh, you know, I don't like remarketing. It's like you wanted that content, you got that content, we're done here. Um, but I am rewriting the content. So I'm going through the process right now of splitting out the technical and the behavioral questions. And I'm also starting up two other lists that are focusing. Uh, one is going to focus on um, like just the tech challenges and why we do tech challenges and different things about tech challenges. And the fourth one was going to be like just general interview preparation kind of stuff. Um, so like how do you do company research and things like that. And so it's going to encompass a lot of the advice and stuff that I've been giving on the stream. And the goal is to get four mailing lists and they're going to be different lengths. So you can subscribe to all of them at the same time um, or you can just do one and then the other. Totally be up to you at that point. So yeah, cool. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully that's going to work out. Um, I have no ETA on that. I think what I'm going to start doing is splitting the behavior on the technical questions into two lists, and then I'll do the general prep uh, from there. So I've I've got I've got the structure of it, and I've got a fair amount of the content written, but I have to rebuild all of this software that I built that actually sends out the emails. Because uh, I have to rebuild the database for which list you've subscribed to, where you last left off on that particular list. So it's all custom written software. Um, and so I've got to go back through and I've got to like rewrite that, rewrite the database structure. 
uh, and so on. So we'll, we'll get there. Um, Subsector 3D. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for dropping by. Um, yeah, Subsector 3D hangs out in uh, Loyal Moses' uh, chat. And uh, yeah, we have, uh, we have a lot of fun over there for sure. Um, let's see. Subsector 3D. Do you also stream? You do also stream. All right. So let's go, let's go give a shout out to uh, Subsector 3D. See if this command works. Uh, Subsector 3D. See if that worked. It did not. I think I spell it out. Shout out. Subsector 3D. There we go. Yeah, so go give Subsector 3D a follow. Um, so they're also a maker. I, I love following other makers on uh, on the stream um, and just kind of lurking on their channels and see what's going on. Uh, so yeah, go give them a follow. Uh, I just set to follow myself. And they are... They're huge into Star Trek, um, and, and typical, like most of the, most of the makers that I follow are big into Star Wars, but Subsector 3D is big into Star Trek, which is cool because my wife is a huge Trek nerd as well, and uh, so those of you that have heard me tell the story about getting our dog, I wanted a purebred lab uh, to go into dog shows. This was like a month before the pandemic hit, and then all the dog shows shut down, and my wife didn't want a puppy, so I thought, well, I'm going to name the puppy after a Star Trek character and named him Riker because uh, he's he's my number one um and uh didn't win her over <laughs> but well surely giving him a star trek name would help and, and it didn't um but once he got full grown she loves him now she goes running with him she took him to introduce uh, Riker to her horse um so yeah it's a lot of fun but yeah typically typically the people that uh that we get involved in on the on the maker streams uh we're into printing like star wars related stuff so this is a I forget what this was like a wrecker helmet or something like that um so i tried printing one this is as big as i can make it on my printer but it actually won't fit it's way too small for me it won't even fit my youngest kid um, but this is the kind of stuff that we typically uh, like to nerd out on on those streams um, but for those that know me i'm also a huge marvel nerd so uh i'm, I'm big into like funko pops i just got uh, baron zemo the other day as well as a new scarlet witch and uh, these are exclusives that Marvel gives to Amazon, and there's a subscription box that you can do. Of course, I say I'm a huge Marvel nerd, and I'm wearing I'm wearing a new Batman T-shirt today, but uh, from the new Batman movie. Um, the new Batman movie was pretty good. I'm not gonna lie, it was it was good. I like Robert Pattinson as Batman. Don't don't buy him as Bruce Wayne though. He's he's a little too emo. But uh, but anyway, um, Subsector's dogs are Tilly and. Adira, cool, very cool. Um, if if those are also, I think Tilly is, is a Star Trek name. I don't follow Star Trek uh, very much, so uh, apologies. I, I'm not up to uh, the lore and the canon on the, on the Star Trek stuff. My wife would probably be like, "Oh yeah, that's so and so," and they've been on the, you know, this many shows and whatever. My wife loves nerding out on that stuff. So cool. Thanks for dropping by, Subsector. Uh, RC Maniac, good to see you in chat as well. Uh, I'm just gonna poke your head in. Need to do some stuff. Yeah, me too. So typically on Sunday, I would be like going to Costco and doing all our groceries for the week and doing food prep and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I'd get home and you know get meal prep stuff together. And I'm like, oh shoot, I got a stream at Sunday night. Um, and so I wanted to change the time of the stream to be Sunday morning, so that I can get up, you know, kind of relax, have a breakfast, you know, do do my Sunday morning kind of routine, stream. And then I've got the whole rest of the day to do like groceries and food prep and meal prep and and uh, and then just chill Sunday evening instead of like being all wound up and oh got to get this up on YouTube and stuff like that. So um, so we'll see. I think I think that this time is also going to work out better. I've had a lot of people from the UK reach out wondering what is tech interviewing all about. How is it different in America? People from over there that want to interview for jobs in America, like what's that going to look like? Um, how, you know, what do we need to prepare? What do we need to do differently? Is there anything we need to do differently? All that kind of stuff. Um, and so I wanted to accommodate as many folks as I could. And so I thought by streaming on a different time, it would allow for that. There are also some really great people that I've, I've chatted with um, that, um, that do interview prep over in the UK that I wanted to have on the stream as guests. So if you've watched the stream, you know I, I like to occasionally have people on here. In fact, when we started the stream, I had the, the double panel thing going here um, because my stream deck was programmed. Uh, I hit the wrong button. And um, 
I like having people on the stream and I wanted to have some of these folks from the UK and we did in the past we had someone from Norway come on the stream but it was like three in the morning for them it was it was almost 4 a.m. by the time we got done like the conversation it was a whole panel of us and we were talking about why don't we hire more junior devs in the industry and uh, we had um, we had this guy from Norway on the stream uh, his last name is Vitek Greg Greg Vitek uh, I was trying to remember his first name and it you know it was like 2 a.m. for him when we started and the conversation just kept going and kept going and kept going and kept going two hours later I'm like okay dude it's 4 a.m. like I'm so sorry to keep you up so late he's like no no this conversation was fantastic and it was it was a whole panel of us and we were just griping and nerding out on like why don't we hire more entry-level devs how can we hire more entry-level devs what can we do as companies to encourage hiring more entry-level devs and uh, it was a really really good conversation and uh, but it, it also made me realize like hey if I want to have other cool people from the UK or Europe on the stream I need to stream at a different time uh, I'm gonna change one of these lights over here just so there's a little more contrast behind me I think uh, let's go with orange um, and and so I wanted to stream Sunday morning and so if I have a guest on the stream on a Sunday morning they're probably not from America this is why I wanted to do this time just to help accommodate for that so we'll see um rc manic says there's a good chance i'd be asleep right now yeah for sure um saturday and sunday tend to be my sleep in days because my my work week is is really varied as far as like start time like some some mornings i start really early some days i end really late um and so my schedule is kind of all over the time plus the streaming and and things like that and things that i want to be involved in and hanging out on loyal moses's stream they tend to go on and on and on for like four or five hours um but if you're into 3d printing uh, go check out Loyal Moses. Let me give that one a shout out here too. Shout out to Loyal Moses. Um, every stream, he's giving something away. Like Friday night, he gave away a 3D printer and a bunch of filament um, and t-shirts, I think. Um, but like every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, when he streams, he's given something away. And it's typically spools of filament. Um, but this past Friday, he gave away a 3D printer. I think on the 15th, he's giving away another 3D printer. I think he's going to give one away sometime this week as well. Um, and, and they're for people that don't have a 3D printer. And so if you want to get into 3D printing, go follow Loyal Moses. Um, it's, his streams tend to be pretty long. And so if he says he's doing a giveaway, try joining like an hour, hour and a half into the stream. <laughs> Because that's typically when he starts doing the giveaway. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to start doing this thing. And then he hits a button on his stream deck. It says two hours later. Um, because that's kind of the running joke. Because every time he says he's, he's about to start doing the giveaway, it, it almost literally takes two hours for him to actually give things away. Um, but it's a fantastic community. It's a really, really great community. I love going in and supporting folks in there uh, with uh, subscriptions and stuff like that. So. But uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out today. Um, I've got uh, a little bit of a backlog of some Q&A of questions that people submitted. And I wanted to recap a little bit of some stuff that I did with a mentee yesterday. Uh, we got talking about all kinds of stuff. We, we started the session talking uh, like he wanted to talk about behavioral questions and then started chatting about, um, you know, when I get in and they start asking me these questions like, what if I can't finish them? And, and how do you think about things like system design? And, and how do you break these problems down? And, and he, was, he was basically tasked with how do you design an elevator, which is a pretty typical system design kind of question where it's how do you, how do you design and, and, and sort of craft or plan an elevator system? And what, what this guy did is like during the interview, and this is what he was struggling with. He's like, well, I started making assumptions. I'm like, okay, well, it's like, two floors and so people are just going up and down so they just have like a button to go up and a button to go down and that's all they need and so he went through and he was designing it but they only gave him like five minutes to talk about it well during the conversation they're like well what if there's more than two floors like what if there was a third floor a fifth floor a tenth floor like then what would you do and he got really stuck and so what i wanted to do today was was share a little bit of the advice that that i gave him around how do you do system design and and you know, what are some good resources for that kind of thing, but also how to think about, uh, you know, technical challenges like that. So the first thing I'm going to drop in chat is a link to a really great resource that I found. So if you're if you're into tech interviewing and you want to learn about system design, um, Don Martin put this together. I, I don't know whether you pronounce it Don or Donnie, um, 
but um, this guy put together, um, he, he's basically a, a product lead at Facebook, and he put together a really thorough system design primer. And there are links on there that you can go find like more system design interview questions and things like that, some of them with answers. But what I was telling uh, my mentee, so he's a junior dev, so just some background on, on him. He's a junior dev, he's been out of school for about a year and he's trying to find a job. And uh, he went through the classic CS degree and it's taken him a year to try to find a job. And so we started our sessions talking about, well, why is it taking a year? Like, what have you been doing over the year? I, I looked at their GitHub and their GitHub is totally blank. And I'm like, as a hiring manager, that's alarming because it makes it look like you haven't done any coding. So I'm encouraging them, like, you got to get some kind of side project going, like show them that you're still continuing to learn and that it's not like I graduated, my learning is done. I'm just going to like kick back and wait for the job to land in my lap. Uh, but what I was telling him about these design questions is like how, like as an interviewer, how we score those kinds of questions, we think a little bit about, do you make assumptions or do you ask questions? And if you make assumptions, are they good assumptions or are they like very outlandish? Because we want to know that you've at least got, you know, one foot in reality when you're trying to design these kinds of things. And so for him making an assumption of like, okay, there's only two floors, that's a pretty that's a pretty hard uh, uh, sort of assumption to make, that there's only one possible floor. And so you're either going up or you're going down, and there's only one floor to stop at. And so I was telling him, well, if I were asking that question, I would have, I would have started by saying, you have a building with at least three floors. How would you design an elevator? Um, but I told him, like, you can make assumptions on how big is the building, how many people live on the floor, or is it an office building or a residential building? Like, you need to clarify it a little bit so you get some idea of what it is they want you to design. When you think about an elevator system, if it's an office building, you probably want the elevator cars to start at the bottom floor in the morning because people are going to go up to their office. And then later in the day, you probably want the elevators to start at an upper floor because people are going to be coming down to the lobby at the end of the day. And so you may want to program some smarts as far as like what floor the elevators are resting at while waiting to be called, or does everything just kind of happen in the middle? Like do you park them all in the middle of your building so that no matter where you are, you're waiting about the same amount of time for an elevator. As a user, we need to balance the user experience with the efficiency of the system. And so we can over design for efficiency at the expense of the user experience, or we can make the best possible user experience at the expense of operating efficiency. And these are also things that we think about as interviewers when we're listening to your answer. And so I was like expanding quite a bit on how we go through and how we would listen to your assumptions and were they good assumptions and so on. And so thinking about problems like how much money would you charge to wash all the windows in Seattle? Um, that's also, I mean, that used to be a common, like sort of brain teaser and, and, you know, these brain teaser questions, they were asked a lot more back in like 2006 to 2010 kind of range. Uh, and it was a lot of, you know, how many golf balls fit in an airplane or how many golf balls fit in a school bus kind of thing. And Hey, G and D good to see you in chat. Um, and those kinds of questions, they were all answered kind of the same way where people are like, well, how big is the school bus? Like, what are the inner dimensions of the school bus? And then what's the size of the golf ball? And then you do some math and there's your approximate answer. And so everybody started answering the questions kind of the same way to the point where it wasn't helpful to ask those questions anymore. So in 2009, 2010, somewhere in there, Google published. Uh, so Google was, was the company that kind of started these brain teasers. Although Microsoft was known to ask some in the past, uh, they would ask like, why is it when you look at a spoon your reflection or your your mirror is reflected upside down, but not also left and right. Um, or or why when you look in a regular mirror, your your image is is flipped on one plane and not the other. But when you look in a spoon, it's the opposite. And like, they they would ask questions like that. Um, and um, in 2006, 2005, 2006, when Google got started, they were asking a ton of these brain teaser questions just to try to find people that, you know, thought a little bit differently about things. But by 2009, they published a paper going, yeah, we actually don't get very good signals off of those questions anymore because everybody kind of answers them the same way. But it kind of kick-started this trend in 2005, 2006 when it got started 
where people are like, oh, Google asks that kind of question. We want to be like Google. We're also going to ask those kinds of questions. And so by 2009, when Google's like, yeah, we're not going to ask those anymore. Everyone else is like, yeah, we're not going to ask those anymore either. Those are dumb. Um, but we've seen that pattern kind of over time where Google shifted into more of the leak code style technical challenges of like, here's this like novel sort of technical challenge to do. And everyone else was like, oh, those are amazing. We want to do those too. Um, and as people would leave Google and go to other companies, they're like, well, this is what I did as an interview. So we're going to do it here too. Um, and, and so it's, it's kind of perpetuated from there. Last summer, we saw Amazon and Facebook announce that they're not asking dynamic programming problems anymore. And I think it's a matter of time before we start to see that kind of trickle down into other companies going, yeah, everybody answers DP problems the same way. So we're not going to ask them anymore either. So when it comes to these design questions of like, how do you design an elevator? How do you design a parking lot? Everybody's kind of got the same answers. But as an interviewer, we sometimes recognize that sometimes junior devs don't know how to answer those questions. And so we may still ask those kinds of questions to an entry level dev. And if we say like, hey, this is just meant to be a five minute kind of conversation, it could be just a warm up just to kind of get your brain going a little bit on like, how would you answer this kind of thing? How would you solve this kind of question or, or this kind of problem? just to kind of get things warmed up, get you talking, get you relaxed a little bit because interviews are nervous. They're it's like it's nerve wracking. And one of the things that my mentee also mentioned was they wanted to like sketch something out and they're like, could I actually draw some things and like show you what I draw? And they're like, well, we prefer to be on camera. And he's like, well, can I share my screen then? And the guy was like, well, no, because I'm sharing my screen and we can't both share our screen at the same time. And it was a very rigid kind of interview. And I said, well, that's actually the sign of a bad interviewer that they wouldn't accommodate that. As an interviewer, my job is to accommodate people as much as possible. And so I'm going to try to do things as much as I can. If you're a visual person, I'm going to give you a visual prompt. If you're an audible learner, I'm going to give you more of an audible prompt. And so when I do my, my interviewing and, and when I do, especially with my mock interviewing, and I give somebody a, a challenge to solve, I give them both a written prompt and I also read it to them and I say, Hey, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I'm going to give you some highlights and then I'll give you some time to read it if you need it. And typically what happens is when I read it to somebody and they start asking, Hey, I got some questions about such and such and such. If I know that what they asked is in the prompt, then I know that they're an audible learner and I need to vocalize more as an interviewer. If I give them the written prompt and then I kind of vocalize, like, let me give you the highlights and they start out by saying, cool, can I take a minute just to read this myself? Then I know they're a visual learner and they want to pick up the visual cue and they probably tuned out everything I just told them. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Take a minute or two, read through, ask any questions that you have. And so as an interviewer, I'm paying attention to what what is their learning style because I need to keep track of that while they're working through the problem. And so if they have a question and I know that they're an audible learner, then I'm going to explain more to them. If I know that they're more of a visual learner, then, and they ask a question and they say, well, what about this kind of scenario? I'm going to give them a different kind of example as part of the prompt and, and actually like give them more information so they can visually see what's going on. Or I may explain things in a more visual way with the, with the uh, example, like input output. Like if you have this input, it should generate this output. And I may highlight some things on their screen a little bit more because a good interviewer should do that. A good interviewer should also be trying to find questions that have more than one answer to get or like more than one solution to get to the answer. Um, technical challenges should never be so rigid as to only have one right answer. There should be many ways of getting there. There may be one that is preferred or there may be pros and cons of efficiencies or doing it one way over another. But that's also our job as the interviewers to try to discern what have you studied? What do you know? Why did you choose that way over the other? And so we're going to be asking you questions while you're designing, while you're building things. And so when it comes to these design questions of design an elevator, design a parking lot, design a reservation system, whatever, everybody kind of answers them the same way. But for an entry level dev, you may not have studied those kinds of problems before. And so we want to hear what kind of ideas do you have? How many gas stations are there in LA? What kinds of assumptions are you going to make about that? Well, how big is Los Angeles? Let's make an assumption. We'll call it 200 square kilometers. 
Um, I'm originally from Canada, so I still think metric sometimes. So let's say 200 kilometers. And you could say, okay, well, let's imagine there's one gas station for every five square kilometers. So you do some math and this is an approximate amount. And it's like, okay, well, if you think about how big, like how many people live in Los Angeles, that 200 square kilometers is probably like 80% residential. You're not going to find a gas station in the middle of a residential neighborhood. You're going to find it on the fringe or on the outside of like a commercial zone where the commercial and the residential zones meet. That's where you're going to find the gas stations. So maybe we need to lump more gas stations in with the commercial space and not the residential space. So of that 200 kilometers, how much of that space is commercial? Let's call it 15%. It's like, okay, well, 15% of 200,000 is three or 200 square kilometers. Let's call it 30 square kilometers. Maybe in every square kilometer of commercial space, you're going to find like two. So now we can kind of narrow down a little bit more. How many gas stations might we find? And so as a, as an interviewer, we're listening for how are you making these calls? Like, how are you deciding these things? Are they good assumptions? Are they bad assumptions? If you just do it on population, like let's, let's say LA is like 25 million people say, okay, well, if there's one gas station for every thousand people, then you're going to need so many gas stations. But that's also a bad assumption too, because of 25 million people, you've probably got 10 million that are under the driving age. They're not even going to own a car. You're going to have a certain quantity of population that don't own a car. They take mass transit. You're going to have a certain age that they're too old to drive and they're not going to be driving either. So like all these kinds of considerations that you have to make. And so as an interviewer, we might ask like, you know, are all 25 million of those people going to be drivers? It's like, well, no, maybe it's only this many. Okay, well, let's revise the math then. And so my job is to like prompt you with things to just kind of refine your thinking a little bit kind of as we go. And so this is how we grade those kinds of questions. You may not get asked those kinds of questions. That link that I dropped though around system design is a really good like low level, like here are all the different components of, you know, content delivery network systems and caching systems and how to make writable APIs and readable APIs and how these things all work together and how you get into like database replication and all this stuff. That is an entry level dev, you don't need to know that deep of detail, but if you go through and you study it, you're gonna really stand out. But I often talk to people about system design and say, you need to do system design like Bob Ross paints a painting. Bob Ross doesn't start by painting the happy little tree. He doesn't get into the fine minute little detail until the very end. And you need to do the same thing when you're designing like an elevator system. Don't get focused on what the panel looks like and what the buttons are. Or another common one is the vending machine, like design a vending machine. And a lot of people focus on like, what's the little panel that the user hits and how does that control the mechanism, blah, blah, blah. But people forget about, well, what about the box? What about the power? Is it a soda machine? It's going to need cooling. Or if it's a coffee machine, you're going to need some way to keep water hot or like to even get water into the machine and, and keep it hot. And, um, you know, don't forget about the mechanism that actually has to turn to drop that bag of chips and like there's all these different components that you have to think about but a lot of people just focus on the user interface of like how do I put my money in there and how do I hit a button and so with system design you have to do it like Bob Ross paints a painting he starts with the sky and then he, you know there's, there's usually like happy little clouds and then there's like this uh what does he call it uh, an almighty mountain or almighty trees right as he likes to paint in these things but he starts with the really big details and then he gradually gets into the detail more and more on each thing. Like he'll paint the sky and then he'll paint kind of the shape of the cloud. And then he fills in the detail of the cloud and then he'll fill in the shape of the mountain. And then he adds the snow on the mountain as the detail. And then he adds the foothills and then he adds the trees to add detail to the foothills. And then he'll add the big tree with the shadow and then he'll put a color over top of it to get into more detail. And we kind of have to do the same thing with system design where we start with like, this is the API that I'm going to build. So I'm going to need a front end. I need kind of some middleware. I might need some back end, like an API. I'm going to need a database. So like, tell me these main components and now gradually get into a little more detail on each one and then go back and get into a little bit more detail on each one and then go back and give me a little more detail on each one. Or at some point you can say like, Hey, is there any of these that you want me to go like really deep on? And I'm just going to focus on that one component. Or do you want me to keep talking about all of these things and go into a little bit more detail on each one as we go? And so if you think about it from like an altitude perspective, 
you want to start at that kind of that 50,000 foot view with everything and then say, okay, now let's bring everything down to 30,000 feet and bring everything down to 10,000 feet. Now bring everything down to ground level and then we can go deeper and deeper and deeper uh, from there on all of those components. But that also helps reduce the complexity because you don't want to have to talk about 50 different systems as you're designing this, this kind of stuff out. And most system design questions are not meant to be that big. Like they want you to design like two or three, maybe four major components and then gradually get into finer detail on those. Um, and so I wanted to share kind of that experience that I had with this mentee yesterday about talking about, you know, design and system design and things like that. Um, just by way of saying like, hey, there's a lot to consider here. And as an interviewer, these are the kinds of things that I'm listening for and the kinds of things that I might score and grade and then give you feedback. But also listening to how as an interviewer, am I going to be prompting you with questions to come up with, you know, better thinking if you start making bad assumptions. And so my my primary advice is as much as possible, whether it's a technical challenge or a design challenge, try really hard not to make assumptions. If it's an offline thing where they're like, here's this thing we want you to go build, you got like a day or two, like just go build this thing and send it back in. You can always email them back questions or, or contact them and say, hey, I've got some questions about how to build this thing. Should I assume this, 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 or can I just, you know, do you have answers for such and such? And if they've got answers, they'll tell you. If they want you to make assumptions, they just won't answer. Um, and at that point, then you can, you can make assumptions, but you should document what those assumptions are and why you made those assumptions so that they have more insight into your thinking as to why you built it the way that you did. When they have that kind of documentation to go along with it, like, hey, you wanted me to design an elevator system. Um, I tried writing back to find out like how many floors I should design for, but I didn't get an answer. So I made an assumption that there were five floors. And I also made an assumption that there were 100 people that lived in the building, therefore 20 people on each floor. Um, let's call it like five apartments. So there's like so many people per apartment. And, you know, some of them are going to be leaving all at different times. And so these were the assumptions that I made to get started on this, the building and how many elevator cars I might need and where I'm going to park them, you know, when they're at rest and so on and so on. If, if you document all of that, then it gives them much more insight into why you design things the way that you did. If you don't document that kind of stuff and you just hand in some code and say like, or, or like a UML drawing or a flowchart of like, this is how I designed my, my elevator system, they kind of miss out on like, but why did you do it that way? And so the more of that you can document, the better for them, the better they're going to be able to see how you think, um, hear about like your thought process and your design process and your decision-making process. And those are all things that we really need to care about during an interview. Um, so as much of that as you can document or verbalize, the better. If you just work quietly and just hand something in at the end, they miss out on that stuff. And it doesn't mean that you won't pass the interview, but you're more likely to pass the interview if they know why you did something. So try to vocalize, try to, um, you know, document as much of that as possible when you're handing stuff in. Cool. I'm probably going to clip all that out and I'm probably going to put all that in a podcast uh, for later because I, uh, I haven't been doing the podcast stuff since like December. Um, so I, I do want to go back to some of these old episodes and like find some clips and like get all this stuff kind of pulled out and like put into, uh, put into some podcast audio again uh, going forward. So I may, I may start planning that kind of thing for more of these uh, sessions where I'll do like a 20 minute like kind of blurb on a topic. And then I'm going to like clip that out and put that in the podcast. So we'll see. But typically what I would do is I would take these Q&A sessions where I would say, okay, here's a question that I got. Here's my answer. Here's a question that I got. Here's an answer. And I would clip out each of those questions and I would make both a short YouTube video as well as take the audio and, and put that into the podcast as well. And that actually worked out really well. I got a lot of viewership on the podcast and a lot of viewership from uh, the shorter YouTube videos because nobody wants to, for some reason, nobody wants to sit around and just listen to me yak for two hours long. Uh, I don't get very much viewership on the on the longer videos, and that's okay. Um, but if you are watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. <laughs> I'm bad at marketing, and you need to help me. Uh, so tell a friend. Um, but with the shorter YouTube videos, people were able to consume those much, much easier. Um, and so if anybody's got time, you may see like a little uh, stream elements thing from time to time. Um, 
or I, I, at least I used to, I think I turned it off. Um, if, if you've got time and you wanna go back through some of the YouTube videos and just mark like, hey, you asked a question at this minute, this second kind of thing, um, that would be a big, big help for me to go back and like clip those things out later. So if anybody's got some time and you wanna pick like one episode that doesn't already have, uh, if you look at the description, you'll see chapter notes in there where it's like a timestamp and then a phrase. If you don't already see that on a video, if you could help me out and just go like add a comment, even for like a couple of minutes worth and say like, hey, you asked a question about this at this timestamp and you asked a question about this at this timestamp, that would be enormously helpful for me to kind of go back and like clip those things out to kind of get that podcast back up and running. So it would be a huge help if, if anybody's got time. Um, I get it. Also, nobody wants to go back and rewatch, you know, two hours of, of video, but, uh, but it would be a big help for those that want to kind of come behind us and learn, um, and share that knowledge as well. So, um, if you've got time, that would be a big help. I'm, I'm trying to debate whether I can get my kids to do it and say like, Hey, go watch these videos that dad made <laughs> and like try to write down these timestamps for me. I think it'd be a good way to get them engaged. Um, and help them maybe get a leg up a little bit on like interviewing and what it means to think differently about things and stuff like that. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, my oldest is getting into Python and my youngest is getting into JavaScript. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. We're going to have a full stack family. I have to teach my wife about database design or something and we'll be all set. Um, Cool. If you've got other questions, please drop them in chat. Otherwise, I'm going to switch over to Discord and pull up some of the uh, anonymized questions that I had over there. Um, and we'll go through some of those as Q&A today. And then uh, we'll kind of uh, we'll wrap up from there. So I've been going for about 40 minutes. I usually aim for like an hour, hour and a half at most on these streams. Um, so if you're hanging out, drop, uh, drop a hello in chat. Let me know you're there. And, um, and we'll, uh, we'll get through some more of these questions here. Let me go find the Discord channel. And also I've got, uh, this is Ian's work account. Please follow... Um, so this is my work account. It's Ian the Postmonaut, um, and I will be streaming on that account probably a couple of times a week. I know I'm going to be streaming at least Monday, Tuesday this coming week uh, as I wrap up an API that I'm building for work. It's basically it's a it's a really fun jukebox project that I built, um, and that jukebox is uh, it, it's basically it starts playing some music and then as people go in and vote for their favorite genre or era of music it changes the song and so you could think about it like if you had a a panel of buttons for like uh satellites radio of like i want to listen to 1990s rock no i want to listen to 1980s pop music no i want 2000 pop music no i want like 1990 rock music and so think about it like every time the voting hits a you know whoever's winning the vote after three seconds they get to hit the button kind of thing and so it basically it's like listening to a song but every three seconds the song could change to something else it was really fun to build as a project and we're, we're basically going to be doing some live events with uh, with postman and uh, uh, that's the company that I work at and um, we're going to be doing some events uh, around the country with this company called infobip and they're basically doing this cross-country uh, kind of sort of tour. And they're doing like meetups and conferences and stuff. And Postman is going to be involved in a handful of these in April and May. And so I'm super excited because I get to go give some talks in May. And I'm going to be, I get to go to a tech conference in May. I'm super excited. And uh, I'm going to get to like do some booth time and talk to people about APIs and API design. I'm super excited about it. Um, and I'm going to be showing off this jukebox player. So I'm like really excited to, to get into that and see how InfoBip can make it really easy to make a chat bot and things like that. So I'm going to be streaming about that on my work account. So if you want to go follow Ian the Postmonaut, uh, I would appreciate it. I'm like this close to being an, an affiliate on there, but I need like a bunch of people to watch like a couple of videos. So even if you can just like load it in a browser and just have it going in the background, you don't have to like actively participate. But if you could drop like a chat message now and then, I think it's keeping track of who's watching by who's chatting. Um, and so the more chatter, the better on, on that kind of thing. But, uh, I would appreciate, uh, some extra follows just to make sure I can hit that affiliate status. Um, cool. So let's get into some Q and a, and then, uh, if you've got questions about, uh, tech interviews, uh, questions about just interview skills in general, um, or just questions about working in the tech industry, um, I'm coming up on, I am 25 days away from 26 years in the tech industry. Uh, subsects are still here. Good. I uh, appreciate it, everybody. Got my, my regular trio of Tech Dinosaur, 3D Print Fan, and Python Nate. They like follow me everywhere. I appreciate all three of you. 
hanging out on my work account all the time too. Um, and Heartbender and RC Maniac and Zooey, like y'all dropped by, GND started dropping by more. I appreciate all of you coming by, uh, hanging out in, in chat and helping me, helping me get, you know, gradually inch closer to that affiliate status. I appreciate it. Um, I have enough hours that I've done streaming. I have enough days that I've done streaming, but my average viewership dropped again. Uh, so I'm somewhere around like an average viewership of two and I need to get that over three and then I can like get affiliate status and then I'm, then I'm good after that. So, um, as far as the, uh, the anonymous questions go, I only had a couple left over and then I got to go like collect a bunch more and get them back into discord. Um, and so people DM me questions on LinkedIn. They DM me questions on Twitter, on Quora, on a bunch of different platforms. Some people email me questions. Um, some people text me that have my phone number. They'll text me questions or they'll ask on different Slack communities that I'm on. And I try to compile and, and put all of them into discord. And so I've also got a discord uh, community that you can hang out in. Let me put that in here, discord. Um, you're welcome to hang out in discord at any time and ask questions. And if you DM me on discord, um, or, or DM me anywhere, if you ask me a question privately, I will put it in this anonymous questions channel on discord and I will never share your name. If you ask a question in chat here, um, like Zooey just left a comment, for example, I'm still hoping to attend these after I start work. Um, yeah, and, and Zooey's going to be a guest on the stream at some point too. I want to hear more about Zooey's journey in, into tech and, and things like that. Um, but if you ask a question publicly, then obviously everybody can see your name. And so if you ask a question publicly on Discord, everyone's also going to see your name. But I'm going to answer it on the stream. If you ask me privately though, I'm going to leave your name out of it because not everybody likes asking questions in public. And so if you want to ask me something privately, you totally can. And then I'm going to mention the question anonymously. And... Uh, uh, and answer it as well. So that way everybody kind of feels like, um, I think protected is not the right word, but like you can feel safe about asking questions without like, um, you know, some people are more introverted. Some people just don't like asking questions in public. Uh, some people don't want to look silly by asking what they think is a silly question. And it's like, no, there's no silly question. Like you can ask me anything. I will answer anything on the stream. Uh, I'm, I'm always happy to help out with that. So if you send in a question anonymously, I'll, I will always ask it anonymously and answer it uh, to the best of my ability. Um, sometimes if, if someone DMs me on LinkedIn, I'll have a conversation with them and I'll answer them on LinkedIn. So I don't, like, I'm never going to answer your question with like, oh, tune into the stream on Thursday when I answer this for you. I'll, I'll answer you wherever you ask me the question, but I'm also going to bring the question over the stream so that I can share it more publicly as well. Uh, but I will leave your name out of it. So. Uh, only silly questions. Yeah, the only silly question is the one not asked. I mean, there are silly questions like why is abbreviation such a long word? There are some silly questions for sure. Uh, Karim says, uh, I want to get into civic tech. Any advice for a mod for a back end Turing student on where to start and knowledge about where the industry is at? So for civic tech, civic tech is actually a really interesting industry where you're getting into uh, like more public style uh, type of technology and data and things like that. And so there's a lot of like open data initiatives around how do we, how do we make this data available? Do we make an API for this or do we publish it and like, you know, publish CSV data or JSON data that people can download and, and do something with? Um, so there are some really good civic tech companies. I've actually been out of the loop a little bit since I left Turing a year ago. Uh, as an instructor, so I don't have good company names right off the top of my head or where they're at in the industry, but I do know that there is a huge movement. Uh, in fact, one of the guys that I work with at Postman, his name is Ken Lane. Um, you can go follow him on Twitter. Let me go get his Twitter handle for you. I think it's just Ken Lane. Um, Ken Lane. Yep. Um, and so I will drop his Twitter handle here in chat. He does a lot with uh, kind of open uh, open APIs and, and things like that. And he actually works uh, a little bit with the government. And he, he had worked in the past with government agencies about how do we how do we make things more open uh, to be able to access these, you know, these data 
you know, volumes and masses of data through APIs that we want to make available to the public. But like, how do we do it in a way that people can access in more of a uniform kind of way? They don't have to log into a website to get it. And, you know, and, and then every agency is like putting their data in different formats and whatever. And so he helped uh, push a lot of legislation and so on, or he's working with legislators about how to build APIs and, and how to do this on a more consistent basis. Um, and so I would start by following Ken and maybe drop questions on Twitter for Ken about like, hey, I want to get into civic tech. How do I get started? He can probably point you to some resources. Um, depending on the location that you're at, you could probably find some, uh, some like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like local government, um, like more regional or county level government and go talk to them and say like, hey, do you have a technology department that I can talk to? I'm really interested in getting involved in civic tech. Uh, what kinds of openings are available? What would I need to be qualified for these kinds of roles? Um, and talk to them about it and see what they can, uh, see what they can make available for you. Because I think that that'll, that'll make a big, uh, big impact for you just to see what kinds of roles are out there and what's possible. Um, because there, there is this growing industry around like people want access to this data, but it does need to be in kind of this uniform, uh, sort of way of doing it. If you're in Colorado, for example, I know that there are a huge number of companies that are working with, uh, kind of civic level government around, um, like local city governments and so on to publish data and get access to data and make more and more data available over APIs. Um, so as a back-end student, I think that that would be really ideal. You might need to learn a little bit about what we call ETL, um, which is extract, translate, and load, which is kind of a database term around how do I get data out of one system and transform it to make it available for some other system, which is effectively what your API is going to be doing. You're going to be talking to database systems to go collect a whole bunch of data and then make it available in like a JSON format or an XML format or something like that, depending on what your end user is requesting as far as like exporting that data. So there are going to be a lot of technology groups doing that. There will be some at a federal level as well, if you want to do that at a more federal level. But, you know, there's also going to be state level uh, groups working at stuff like that. So that would probably be where I'd get started is I would start at a city level, move up to state level and move up to a federal level from there. Uh, and see what's available. Uh, now, a lot of those, you're going to need background checks and, and things like that. Um, anytime you're working with government type groups, uh, you'll probably need like background checks and things like that. If you, if you are eligible for security clearance, that's probably going to help a lot too. Cool. Thanks for the question. Appreciate that. Um, all right. So let's get into another one of these anonymous questions. Um, so someone had asked a question, what can be considered as a good answer to the interview question of why switching between companies in a short time? Now, the grammar of this was a little off. So let me rephrase the question. What's a good answer if an interview asks why you switched between many companies in a short amount of time? I think that this is a good question for especially entry level developers. I often say on my live stream that when you start your first job in tech the first job is going to feel amazing because it, you know you got that first job and finding that first job is really hard and so getting that first job feels incredible but after a couple of months in the shiny kind of wears off a little bit and you realize things that aren't good about the job and sometimes you think you want to go down a particular path or a particular route in the tech industry and you get into that job and realize ah, this actually isn't what i want to be doing I think I want to go explore this other thing instead. Well, the good news is because you're already employed, it's easier to get that next job. But if you've only worked at that first job for a few months or less than a year, changing your job really quickly can sometimes be a bit of a, uh, an alert or a flag to recruiters going, ah, do I really want to hire somebody that just started this job three months ago? At the same time, I get reached out to all the time by recruiters going, hey, do you want to, do you want to, come interview for this job. It's like, I literally just started my job like two months ago. Like, why are you bugging me? And I actually posted that on LinkedIn and Twitter. And I had some responses come in from recruiters going, yeah, but you could realize within that month that you hate the job or you hate the company or you hate your coworkers and you do want to change. And so that's why recruiters are still reaching out all the time. Once you are employed, you will start getting recruiters reaching out to you. But 
if you if you kind of do this hop like every six eight months or less it does start to be a bit of an alert to recruiters going why are you changing your job so frequently it either makes you look bad because you're not willing to sort of stick it out at a company long term or you might be you know for lack of a better word you might be a little fickle as far as what it is you want to be doing in tech or that you're you know to use a more negative term maybe you're a little bit ignorant about what you want to do in tech and so you just want to go try all these things at the same time that is my advice to people that go get a job in tech your first job isn't going to be your favorite job it's going to feel like your favorite job when you start because it's your first job but you might get in there and go ah, you know what this isn't what i want to be doing i'd rather explore this instead well you are in charge of your career you're in charge of where your career goes you're in charge of that path you'll often hear me talk on the live stream a lot about how working in the tech industry is a lot like those choose your own adventure books that you can get at the library where you finish a chapter and you're kind of reading it from a from a third person perspective saying hey if you want your character to go do this turn to page 502 if you want your character to do that turn to page 306 and so then you go to that chapter and it's kind of a continuation of the story as if you had made that decision and the tech industry is a lot the same way where you can decide when you finish at one job you can say you know what i think i want to go into this other kind of job and that's totally all right and and you can um, you can go explore different kinds of roles but if you're doing that quickly and you're you know you're rotating through those jobs relatively quickly at some point it is going to start to look a little bit bad for you that you're probably going to want to um, you're probably going to want to settle in a little bit on like, what is it that you really want to be doing? Um, now that you've been in a couple of different roles, like maybe you've done a full stack kind of job, maybe you've done a back end kind of job, maybe, or maybe you started on the back end, then you went more full stack and then you went to the front end and then you went, you know, back to back end or something like they're going to want to see you kind of settle a little bit on like, okay, this is what I think I want to do for the next like year or two and like stay there for a while. So if you get asked about why you've job hopped, job hopping is totally all right, as long as you have a good story to tell. If you say like, yeah, that first job didn't work out, um, or I learned what I thought I wanted to be doing, and then I realized that wasn't the path I wanted to take, and so I wanna take this job instead because this is more aligned with what I wanna be doing. But after the third or fourth company, it starts to, it, it's gonna be hard for them to accept that as a story. Like, oh, I thought I wanted to do backend, so, you know, I got that first job doing back end and then I went and got a job doing full stack because I wanted to do a little bit more on the front end. And then I realized I really liked front end. And so I went and I got a full time, you know, front end job. And then I realized, ah, you know what? I don't like front end. You know, I really, you know, I was actually pretty comfortable doing back end kind of stuff. And so now I'm back over here and I want to focus on back end. That's going to get to be a harder story to tell over time of like, why are you making these decisions to settle in on what you want to do in your career? But if you have a good story and you can explain it well, then they're not going to mind. Um, every, I think every interviewer that you talk to is, or every recruiter that you talk to is going to have an easier time um, accepting what you're sharing with them as long as you have a good story to tell. And it's a good progression of that skill. Now, you could say, you know what, that first job, um, it wasn't what I thought I wanted to be doing. And so I got the second job. The second job, you know, as soon as I got in there, they did some layoffs. And so I lost that job, you know, a couple of months in. So that one wasn't my fault. Um, although you don't want to use the word fault when you're talking about that kind of stuff. But they'll start, like, they'll recognize, like, oh, okay, that's it. You know, you didn't leave there on purpose. You know, you got laid off or you got, you know, the, the company laid off a bunch of people or whatever. Or the company shut down or whatever that is. So as long as you have a good story to tell then recruiters and interviewers are going to have a much easier time listening to that story. But you need to really refine that story to talk about what was good about that job, what you learned, and how that's shaping your career going forward. But if you've got a lot of really short-term jobs on your resume or in your CV or your background, your next job needs to be long-term. And so you really need to sell them on the idea of why you're going to stay at that company for a long period of time and say, you know, I don't want any more of these short jobs. I want to settle in. I want to learn everything I can. Your company seems to be the place that I want to do that. And so I'm here. I want to focus in for like several years and be a part of the team. 
that's what's going to, I think, win them over a little bit. Uh, as long as it sounds genuine, that it doesn't just sound like, oh yeah, I want to be here for years and years, and you know, I'm going to be here for a decade. You don't want to, you don't want to come across like over the top on that. But just say like, I'm looking for a team that I'm comfortable working with in an environment that I'm comfortable in, working on great technology where I'm always learning and growing, and I'm looking for something long term. Like I want to be here for several years. You know, you can explain it that way, and I think that that's gonna that's gonna really help your chances. Uh, Melbury, thanks for the message. I will take a look at that. Um, so thanks for sending that over. Anonymous cheer, just cheered a bit. Yay! Thanks for the bit. Give you some flashy lights and some applause. Thanks for the bit. Even though the flashy light does send a welcome, thanks for the follow message because I programmed that on my stream deck in a weird way. But yeah, I appreciate the, uh, the anonymous bit. Thank you. Uh, all right, so let me go mark that question as being done. So what I do in, in Discord, uh, if you want to come hang out on, on Discord, if you ask a, a question and it goes into my anonymous uh, question pool, I mark them with an emoji once I've answered it on the stream. So anything you go back, if you see an emoji on it, it means I've answered it at some point on the stream. You can go back and listen to those, uh, you know, those other streams. I don't mark like which episode it was, but you at least know that it's been answered. So um, why is it important for an applicant to know how the selection process works? So let's, uh, let's dive into this a little bit more. I'm going to rephrase this uh, as well. So I was asked an anonymous question about, is it helpful or why is it important for an applicant to know how the selection process works in an interview? Typically, a company won't tell you how they select an applicant. They'll basically just tell you like, hey, we are extending you the job offer because we have chosen you. Most companies won't say like, oh, we, we score on this and we evaluate this. Like they'll tell you what the interview process is going to be. Like they'll tell you how many interviews you're going to do and they'll tell you how many people you're going to interview with and they will be able to explain, uh, you know, kind of the different steps and how long the process is going to take, but they're generally not going to share how they select the person that they make the offer to because that's subject to a lot of different reasons and it can also be subject to bias. Uh, I'll be honest with you in, in any industry, not just the tech industry, there's always going to be some level of bias whether it's implicit bias or subconscious bias, there's always going to be some bias in that selection process. But so companies are, are less likely to share how or why they selected a candidate. You will just know that you got a job offer or you got a rejection. Now, the rejection doesn't mean that you're not qualified. It just means you're not qualified for that job at that company at that moment. It could just be that somebody else had slightly better qualifications or, you know, whatever, it could be any number of reasons. The, uh, the takeaway there is as much as it feels personal, it's not a personal decision. It's a business decision on their part. The same way that if you were to go get a job and get multiple offers and you make a decision on which company you want to take, it's also a business decision for you of which business do you want to give your time to, uh, in order to collect a salary. Um, and those are important things that you need to know as a candidate. If you get multiple offers, you get to make that choice the same way that they have multiple people applying for the job and they also get to make that choice. It's the exact same choice of which one do I pick because this is the best choice for me at this moment. So whether you're the hiring manager, I'm looking at a pool of applicants going, which person is the best person to join my team at this time? or whether you are an applicant and you have multiple job offers, which is the best job I can take at this moment for me at this time. It's the same, it's the same decision. And it's not, it's not really a personal decision. They're really just looking at how, um, you know, how you're going to fit in on the team and, and things like that. So again, they're, they're not as likely to share why you got chosen or, or how they're picking a particular person they're just looking at um or they're, they're going to share more information about like what the process is but not how they select somebody now there are there are groups like uh i do know um i interviewed at the los angeles county office of education it was a kind of a mouthful at the time uh they called it laco 
And I, I worked there as a contractor and I actually applied for a full-time job there at one point. And they actually shared the selection process. And so there are groups out there that will share, like this is exactly the process you're gonna go through and this is how we choose who gets the job. And those tend to be very rigid interview structures where they literally grade what you do. And they say, you know, Ian scored 79% and Zooey scored 81%, therefore we hire Zooey. Even though Ian may have more like relevant, you know, experience in this area or that area, it's a lot less subjective that way. And so they're literally using math of like scoring all these different things and they put together like a final score and then they figure out like who gets that job based on whoever got the highest score. Um, but those tend to be very rigid kinds of companies. And so if you get a company where they share that kind of stuff with you, just be aware that it's probably a very rigid process and, and uh, it may not be the greatest place to work. Um, that's not, it's not always a bad thing though, um, that they do that, that they do share that process with you. I think that some of those companies are actually very respectable in being more transparent about that kind of thing. But most tech companies are not going to share the selection process. They're just going to share what the interview process is. Um, let's see, looking through some other questions here. So yeah, if you do have other questions, please drop those in chat, uh, kind of as we go, I'm happy to uh, address those. Um, just looking through a handful of other things here to figure out which one I wanna do next. Um, All right, so let me mark that one as being done. Okay, so the next one that I had on the list, I was told that I lacked experience and could not give them confidence during an interview. How should I improve myself? So to rephrase the question that I got here that was on my Discord community, I was told that I lacked experience and didn't, basically, I didn't project confidence during the interview. How can I improve myself? This one's a little bit hard to answer because I don't know this person personally necessarily. And so it's hard for me to say like, oh, just be more confident in what you do. Confidence does come with practice, but how you sort of portray yourself during an interview can make a difference. There's also a big difference between being proud of the things that you've done and being braggy about the things that you've done on at various jobs. And so that confidence can also come out in different ways as well. You can appear confident in the words that you use and you can appear confident in, uh, in your ability to write code. But I think you do need to project it in a, in a slightly different way. So as an example, uh, I tell people a lot on the stream, like there's a four part process that I like folks to follow when you're doing a technical challenge where you restate the problem back, you ask clarifying questions, you write out some notes or some pseudocode, and then you start on the real code. And when you finish kind of that note taking process and you write out some pseudocode, I typically coach people to ask the interviewer, what's your opinion of this? Literally those five words, what's your opinion of this? Because if you phrase that question like, am I on the right track? Or what do you think about this? or you know um you know am i am i going in the right direction you know kind of thing it it can show a lack of confidence but if you literally just ask them what's your opinion of this then you're kind of projecting like i'm i'm okay with this so far i'm just asking for your input and so how you word things and how you phrase things can can really project confidence but there can also be like an overconfident uh sort of mentality as well and it's kind of the opposite of what we call the imposter syndrome um, and i think it's called is it the dunning kruger effect um where it's it's this overconfident like i think i know all the things and you really don't and it could come across as you know while you're writing your code you could say like oh yeah this is how i'm going to iterate over this data structure and it might work, but it might not be the best way to iterate over that data structure, but it might be the only way that you know, and you're, you're trying to make yourself look confident in how you do something. 
um, where it may not be the best approach, but you're confident in that approach. And so it's, it's one thing to be confident. It's another thing to be overconfident and think that you have skill that you don't. Um, and so if you, while you're writing up that way of iterating over, say, an array or something like that, if you're like, oh, yeah, this is the best way to, you know, iterate over this array, it's like, well, no, that's one way to iterate over an array. It's not necessarily the best way, or it may not even be the best way for that particular challenge, but it is a way that you can do that. So there's, there's a difference between being confident and being overconfident. You can say, this is how I know to iterate over an array. And that's showing I have confidence in this type of iteration. So if you're working in Ruby, for example, you can say, I really know how to use dot each. Um, and so while you're writing up your code, you can say, all right, I'm just gonna dot each over this, this content and I'm gonna extract what I need as I work. Well, there are lots of ways of iterating. You can't, you're, you, you don't have to use just dot each. There are lots of ways that you can iterate over an array. But if you tell the interviewer like, oh yeah, the only way to do this is with dot each. It's like, well, no, that's not correct. That's not technically correct. But if you just say, you know what, I've got this array, I'm gonna iterate over it. I'm just gonna use dot each just for the simplicity of just getting each of those objects. And then I'm gonna iterate over those objects. And, you know, I might find a way to optimize it later, but this is how I'm gonna get started. That's a good way of sort of balancing out the confidence with, you know, I'm not, entirely sure that there's a better way of doing it but this is how i'm going to get started on it at least so for projecting confidence you want to you want to give them like you want to give the interviewer the idea that you know what you're doing in the moment but there may be a way to improve it later but once you get the code written you'll be able to see how to optimize it but that's also why i coach people like write out the pseudocode in the first place if you pseudocode what it is you're trying to write you can sometimes find those optimizations as you pseudocode. Now in the pseudocode, you could just say, I'm gonna loop over the array and then inside of that loop, I'm gonna do such and such. Well, later on you might realize like, oh, because of how I'm dealing with that data inside, maybe I don't wanna use dot each, maybe I need to use dot map or dot reduce or something like that, where I'm extracting data a little bit differently to do something else with it later. But you can typically find that kind of thing later on once you've written the code you can find ways of optimizing it but if you can optimize it while you're writing out the pseudocode it's a better approach and again it gives more confidence to this is how i'm going to get started let me see if i can refine this a little bit more and now that i've refined that hey what's your opinion of this they'll tell you because they want to see you succeed so now they they won't they won't typically tell you and say oh yeah that looks amazing go ahead and get started they may ask questions and say, hey, tell me a little bit more about what you're gonna do with this part or that part. So when they ask you those questions as a follow-up, it might be a question because they spot a problem or it may be a question just because they wanna make sure that you've thought through the problem deep enough. And after that, they'll typically say something like, this looks okay, let's get started. Or this looks like a good place to get started. That's sometimes my verbal cue of like, yeah, I think you can get started with that. Is typically like yeah you can find an answer with that but there's probably a better way of doing it um but and so you have to listen to the interviewer you have to listen to the kinds of things that they say um to know like whether there might be an improvement but you can still be confident in your approach while you're working it really depends a lot on what you say while you're working and so if you're you know if i were like coding it up and go well i'm not really sure if this is the right way to do it but this is what i'm going to do well that's that's verbalizing that I'm not confident. But while I'm writing it, if I were to say, hey, I'm gonna follow that pseudocode and this was the approach I was gonna take. So for now, I'm just gonna dot each over this. I may think of an optimization to do later, but this is at least gonna get me started. Then it's showing that I'm at least confident in what I'm doing at the moment. So try as much as possible to avoid raising and, and saying things that make it seem like where you are verbalizing yourself that you are not confident um it can be it can be important to do that now depending on where you live and depending on location and laws and things like that uh, when i did my job hunt back in december and january i audio recorded my interviews so that i could go back and listen to them to myself in colorado it's legal to record a conversation if you are the only person uh, that sort of allows it. So it's called a one party consent or something like that, where only one person in the conversation 
knows that the conversation is being recorded. And so I didn't tell any of my interviewers that I was recording the interview. And I didn't share it. I didn't put them online anywhere. They're just for my own consumption. And once I listened to them, I deleted them. And so they're gone. So you can do that in an interview, if, especially when it's remote like this. It's just audio record it and then go back and listen to it later and say, how did I phrase things? How did I say things? Did it, did it come across in a way that didn't sound like I was confident? And I think as you start listening for those kinds of phrases, I think, I think it'll really stand out around how to, how to approach um, you know, different things or how to phrase things in a particular way. I think that that would, uh, that would be a big help. Um, so that would be one way to do it is just record the conversation and then go back and listen to it and then delete the recording. You don't want the recording to stick around. Some interviewers, if you say like, Hey, is it okay if I record this interview? They'll probably say no, because they're worried that you're going to share it with other people and they don't want, you know, people to sort of game the, uh, the interview process and sort of cheat their way through because they know what they're going to get asked. Um, but again, depending on laws and things like that. Now, if you live in a state which has to be two-party consent, then you have to let them know that you're recording. Um, but if there's a way that you can just kind of like write down or keep track of like, how did I answer that question? Then I think you can, you can start to narrow in a little bit more of where are you using phrasing where you are not coming across confident and then find ways of improving it. Find, you know, go literally go buy a thesaurus or go check online and say, what's a synonym for this kind of word that I can you know, maybe make it sound more confident without over the top confidence. Because again, you don't want to sound overconfident on things, but you do want to, you do want to project confidence, just not overconfidence. And so maybe it's just your choice of words. This can also be difficult for people who are not native language speakers for wherever you are interviewing. So if you're interviewing uh, with someone who is speaking English and you're not a native English speaker, it can sometimes be hard to choose the correct word to give that confidence. But again, that can come with practice. It can also help to do mock interviews with people who can give you that kind of feedback and say, hey, I was told I wasn't coming across very confident. Could you help me like ask me some behavior questions or ask me some technical questions, listen to my answers, and then, you know, tell me how I can improve. Um, the key there is to get someone to do the mock interview with you who is qualified to give you that kind of feedback. For example, if you're, if you're like a, a, a student and you're about to graduate and you ask another student who's about to graduate, hey, can you give me a mock interview? They're probably not going to be able to give you the same quality of feedback as someone who's been in the industry even a year or two years. So the more you can kind of network and reach out to people who have been in the industry or that do interviews that you can ask them like, Hey, can you listen to my answer about this kind of question and tell me how I can improve yeah, or specifically say like, I'm looking specifically for how to improve my confidence as I answer these questions. So the trick here is, or the key, not the trick. The key here is to find somebody who is qualified to give you that kind of feedback. All right. Um, I had one more come in. Um, this one's actually not in discord, but, uh, let's see. Just want to see if I can rephrase this a little bit. So to rephrase this question a little bit, uh, this person's basically, they're a contractor at a certain salary range. So the manager told them, this is what we're paying for you as a contractor. We want to bring you on board as a full-time uh, employee. And I asked for a certain salary. They came back and countered at a lower salary and wouldn't move any higher. Um, the reason that companies pay contract uh, employees higher is because they're typically paying a contract business or they know that you're paying a certain amount of your salary as taxes and paying your own benefits and things like that. So for example, if I were to go work as a contractor, I might, I might charge a company say $200,000 a year, but 
I don't get to keep all $200,000 of that. I have to pay state tax. I have to pay federal tax. I have to pay for benefits. I have to pay, you know, for my own uh, social security and all that kind of stuff. I've got to pay, like, I've got to keep paying into that. So I'm making money as a business and then I have to turn around. And I have to pay all like a bunch of money back out. When I did freelance work in California, I lost about 51% of my income to taxes and social security and like benefits and all that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's a lot, you lose a lot as a contractor. So the equivalent as a full-time employee, like, yes, the company's paying your taxes and they're paying your benefits and that's coming off your paycheck as well. And so what the company's trying to do is they're trying to keep your take-home pay about the same level, but they know that as a contractor, they need to pay you a lot more because your take home is going to be less because of those taxes. Whereas a full-time employee, they might only have to pay you this much because, you know, they're paying your taxes, but, you know, maybe you're paying part of your benefits plan and things like that. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to find like the equivalent of what your take home pay is going to be. And so by converting you from a contract employee to a full-time employee, they're trying to figure out that point where your take home pay is still the same. Now, if if you've asked for a salary range that's higher than what they've offered this is where you get into negotiations about why are you worth that much if you are paid a certain amount as a contractor i think my my question if if i were to have like back and forth conversation with a person about this um the manager off you know the the, uh, the company was paying them a certain salary as a contractor and then came back much less like Thirty-five, forty thousand dollars less as a full-time role, um, and what they were asking for was like somewhere in between as a salary. If you started like for what they're paying you now, um, like if you've been at that company for a while, like let's say you've been there for a year, did they start paying you that amount? Like you've been making that amount of money the whole time, and now as a full-time employee, they're offering you this lower amount. I would ask them like, hey, what would a brand new person coming into the company be making? Would they also be making this amount of money? Because I've been here for a year. So whenever you're negotiating, you need to explain why you are sort of worth more money. The fact that, you know, if you've been there a year, just as an example, if you've been there for a year, you've got a year of knowledge, you've got a year of experience, you've got a year working with their team, you know their systems, you know the communication, you know their process, you're, you're not just some new person coming in off the street. You already know all this stuff and you've been doing it for, say, that year. That's worth more money than somebody coming in brand new. And so I would, you know, if you've got enough sort of open relationship and open communication with, uh, with that hiring manager to say, hey, like, what would a brand new person coming into the role be making? Because I've been here for a year. So I, you know, I would expect that if I were to convert to full time, then I'm going to be making more than a new person coming in on the team by X amount. Um, like whatever they would typically be coming in at, I would expect like a 10% bump, you know, for kind of like that one year experience, like whatever that uh, sort of uh, anniversary sort of bump, as we call it in pay, would typically be which you would hope with inflation is going to be more than the 7% inflation. So hopefully it's going to be like 10 to 15% more than what a new person would make coming in. And so I would ask them, what would a new hire be making? What would a typical annual raise be? And I would like to make that much because I've been here for a year. I've effectively been an employee for a year. You're just converting the status to full time so I can get benefits and so on. That's how I might start to negotiate that is, is say like, hey, I'm already bringing a year of experience and that's worth more than than what this offer is. So I'd really like to be making this. Um, you could also say like, hey, you've offered this. <coughs> I'd like to be making this range. So when, when you give just a single fixed number, um, like let's say, um, you know, they offer you 100,000 and you say, I want 115,000. If you just throw out a single number, you're not giving them a lot of room to kind of, you know, find find a, a, a sort of a, a good negotiation point in there. Although when they come back, they're giving you a single number. But whenever you give them a number, you want to give them a range and say, I would really like to be making, you know, between 105 and 115. What can we do? And you want to use the we terminology. Like, what can we do? This is a, this is a team effort here. What can we negotiate on? 
to get to that point? Like, are there additional responsibilities? Is there something else I need to go learn? Um, could I get there in six months? Like, could we have another review in six months and see if I've met that milestone? Because I'd really like to be making this range in today's economy with the skill that I have. I know that I'm worth this much money. And so like, if this is your first job, for example, and you've been out in the industry for a year, you've got a year of experience. You're worth more money than somebody who's brand new coming into the industry right now. And so you need to leverage that whenever you're negotiating. So don't just negotiate and say, no, I'm not going to take the job unless you pay me this much. You need to explain why. You need to have a good reason why you're worth that extra money. Even though it feels redundant, they should already know that you're worth that extra money. But, you know, they still want you to negotiate. So I would, I would start with that and just say, like, based on these numbers, what would a new hire come in at? I'd like to be making 10 to 15% more because I've been here for a year and that would typically be the annual raise uh, for somebody with a year of experience. So this, this amount that you've offered me, is this what you would typically offer somebody with a year of experience? Um, so, and, and because that my year of experience is with your systems, I'm not just some person with a year of random you know, development. I've been working on your systems for a year. I've been doing your process for a year. I've been working with your team for a year. I'd like to be making within this range and give them that range and, uh, and see what they say. If they absolutely won't budge, then you need to make the decision of, do I want to stay or not? If they do budge, that's great. Hopefully they do. Hopefully having that conversation with them is going to kind of spark that, oh yeah, you know, you do have a year of experience and yeah, that experience is here with our company. Um, and so you need to explain why you're worth that and then help them make that realization that, you know, you're bringing experience to them and they need to, uh, they need to accommodate that. Um, uh, cool. Last question that I had in my queue, uh, back on discord is, is it better to be the first person or the last person interviewed? So there's a bit of a myth in the industry that if you're the first person to interview, you're going to get the job. Or if you're the last person to interview, you're going to get the job. Um, it's always nice to think like, oh, they interviewed me and then they wrapped everything up because they knew that I was the best. And so I was the last person that got interviewed because they didn't need to interview anybody after me. Um, there was a bit of ego in that. There's no strong indicator really of being the first or the last. There's a really interesting uh, audiobook that I read. Let me go see if I can find the, uh, the title of it. It was like something like um, Computer Algorithms in Everyday Life or something like that. Let me go find it. I, I, I listened to the audiobook on Audible. Let me, uh, let me go log in and get the name of it. But it was really good because they, they, mention, um, they mention an algorithm about um, what was it like hiring secretaries and like how many people do you need to interview to make the best decision about who to, who to hire? Because the first person you interview, you have an amount of data, but if you say no to them and then you interview the next person and that next person is worse, you're like, ah, oh, shoot, we should have hired, you know, the previous person or if they're better, you're like, oh, wow, this person's better. Do we hire them because they were better than the first one? Like, do we keep interviewing and maybe we'll get better still? Um, and so it goes into, um, it goes into this whole like, uh, uh, algorithm of, you know, taking this real world scenario and figure out how do we, um, like, how do we know when to stop interviewing and stop hiring? And it can also play into technical interviewing as well. They've got, <clears throat> let's say they post a job and they get a thousand people applying for that job. How many of those people do they have to interview to make a decision? I might take those thousand people, narrow it down to say 10 people, interview those 10 people, and I hope to make one offer out of that. Um, someone asked in chat, uh, wasn't the answer to hire the first best choice? Yes, but what is best? That's the question is like, how do you know that you've reached that threshold of like, we have found the best person or we found the best person so far? Um, what was it called? so many audiobooks in my audible library algorithms to live by the computer science of human decisions i'm going to drop this link in chat even though it's a amazon uh, audible link um, but it was actually a really interesting book 
Um, and so, yeah, the whole idea here was like, how do you know who is the best? So yes, you do want to hire the first best person, but as a hiring manager, if, if I, if I, um, if I start interviewing a bunch of people and I go, well, this person's the best one so far, do I just stop here and just hire that person? Like, this is, this is what I need. Like, this is all I need right now. This is good enough. I'm just going to hire this person. That's how I approached hiring when I was a hiring manager is I would interview until I found a person that was good enough and I would just make them the offers. Like I could keep interviewing, but if I find like, if everybody after that person is worse and I've told them no, then I've got to interview more and more and more people to try to get back to where that person was, uh, as far as skill level goes. And so it's, it's actually really hard to do as a hiring manager. It's a, it's a hard decision to make. We want the best choice, but sometimes we need to make the best enough choice. Like there's a, there's a saying that I talk about, uh, as well as like system design and, and algorithm design that sometimes good enough is good enough. Like sometimes like solve it as simply as you can add complexity when you need to. And it can be the same thing with hiring. Like just as soon as you get to a point where like, yeah, this person I think could do the job, hire that person. You're done. It, like if you kept interviewing, you might find someone that is even better, but you don't know how long it's going to take. Hiring is already a, a very lengthy process and, it, and therefore an expensive process. And so as much as possible, you want to reduce that expense. You want it, you want that hiring to be done as fast as possible. So sometimes just, Hey, this person's good enough. We're just going to hire them. Sometimes that's all you need. You don't have to hire all thousand of those people, or you don't, sorry, you don't have to interview all thousand of the people that apply for that job. You just need to interview enough people to get to a, a reasonable point where you're like, this person's good enough. Anyway, check out that, that audio book, um, the audio book, uh, or, or even the written book. Um, uh, I'm sure you could find it on, uh, on Amazon as well, but yeah, the one algorithm in there about, um, I, th I think it was about hiring secretaries. And so it's, it's obviously a kind of an outdated, uh, you know, frame of mind and whatever, cause they call them secretaries, but, um, but the, the, the application of the algorithm is still applicable of like, how far do we, how far do we go until we make a decision? But yeah, it was a really, really good book. I, I was actually like, I read through this and I'm like, wow, they cover a lot of really interesting stuff in the, in the book. Um, and it was interesting that they made it an audio book instead of, well, I mean, I mean, they have the, the printed book, but to hear it as an audio book was actually really interesting. So when I had to drive to work and I had like a 40 minute commute, I would throw these audio books on and I would listen to them each direction, uh, going to and from work. And so since I've been home, I stopped listening to, to audio books. And so I was paying for audible for like months and months. And it's kind of like the gym membership that you pay for, for months and months. And you're like, ah, oh, I should probably cancel that someday. Um, so I eventually canceled, but they allow you to maintain access to your library. So I can still go back and listen to this later on. But, uh, it was, it was actually a really, really interesting kind of book. Um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting. Now I kind of want to go back and listen to it again. Cause there were, there were a handful of algorithms that they talk about, like they talk about sorting algorithms and they talk about like the idea of big O notation explained as like everyday kind of algorithms and everyday kind of use case and, and things like that. It was a really interesting way to hear sort of like real world explanations of some of these algorithms and, and why they work the way they do. So yeah, go check it out. It was pretty neat. Cool. I've been going for an hour and a half. I think I'm going to wrap up because I got stuff to do on my Sunday. I'm going to go, uh, go get our grocery shopping out of the way and get some meal prep and f like meal planning and then meal prep and, and stuff like that going. Uh, I made a really good like pasta sauce. I'm debating making some pasta and make a lasagna. We'll see. Um, but yeah, thanks for hanging out, everybody. Appreciate you hanging out on an early Sunday. Um, let's go see if we can find somebody to raid. Who else is online? 1030JH, I think. Are they doing some rust? <clears throat> um, working on creative projects. App hidden from viewers. No, looks like they're doing some gaming or something, maybe. Are they doing some gaming? It's hard to tell. Let me go listen to them real quick. Yeah. So it's a bit of a bit of journey. So on that journey, 
yeah, they're playing some kind of online game. Um, but they've got a huge community and they've raided other people in the past. Um, does anybody have any suggestions on who to go raid? If you're hanging out in chat and you know somebody you want to go raid, let me know. And uh, I will go check them out quickly and see who we can go. Who we can go raid. A lot of gamers, a couple of Lego people. Um, none of my usual followers are, are on there. There's a house renovation. We've raided our WX Rob in the past. Looks like they're doing some Go programming. I wish we could just go raid Bob Ross. Um, let's see, who else can we go raid? Any suggestions in chat of who we can go raid? I want to go raid somebody so we don't just like end the stream. So give me some suggestions. If you're in chat and you have a suggestion of who we can go raid, let me know in chat uh, who you'd like to go raid. Let's see who else is around. Um, oh, Chris Nova. Chris Nova's streaming. Um, so Chris Nova is working on a book called, um, so like hacking capitalism or something like that. Um, doing some work on Linux and Kubernetes, maybe. Uh, Free Heathen is doing some 3D printing. Shelf mount printing, so they're doing 3D print stuff. Uh, any suggestions in chat on who we can go raid? Come on, give me some ideas. Some of you gotta be following more people than just me on uh, on Twitch. Who can we go raid? I don't know if anybody's doing uh, any kind of leak code or anything like that. Let's go search for leak code. Let's see if anybody's doing some live leak code. Wow, nobody's coding leak code right now. Which I guess shouldn't surprise me. It is Sunday morning. Um, no suggestions at all, folks? Come on, somebody give me an idea. Who, who can we go raid? Give me somebody. Um, looks like we got some game development going on. I don't know this person at all. Okay. All right, lacking any other uh, choices, we will go raid. Lena Lux looks like they're doing some game development. So we'll go set up the raid for that. And uh, we'll see you folks over there. Thanks for hanging out on a Sunday. We'll see you back on Thursday at the usual time, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, thanks for hanging out. I'll get this video up on YouTube a little bit later, and I do want to clip out the uh, the that uh, audio for uh, for the podcast later on. So if you have other topics like that that you'd like me to cover, please send those on Discord and let me know, and uh, we'll catch you over on the raid. See you, folks.